Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. With the basics of XAML layouts and events under our belts, let's do something fun now. Uh, we're going to give some unique character to our app by merely styling it. Obviously, we're going to want to follow Microsoft's guidelines so that our app looks like it really belongs as part of the Windows Phone 8 ecosystem. However, we still have a lot of latitude on how we can personalize our app. So my game plan in this lesson is that, first of all, we're going to change the tile icons that are used on the phone's application list. And then also, if they were to pin one of the apps to the start page, we want that tile to be shown there as well. Then we're going to access the user's phone theme color selections and incorporate those colors into our app. And in so doing, we're going to learn some extremely important XAML syntax feature called binding expressions. And then finally, we're going to talk about reusable styles in our app. Okay, so the first task in this lesson is to change the tiles for our app that the user will see in the alphabetical list of tiles. Uh, and also the start page if they wanted to, again, pin one of those to uh, the, our app to their start page. So to begin, what we're going to do is find a file called the wmappmanifest.xml file. And so I'm going to double click it. And when I do that, you'll see that this XML file is loaded into the main area into a special designer window. And it provides a number of options that can affect how our application is introduced to the Windows Phone 8 operating system. For example, on the first tab, the application UI tab, we can change the display name. So if we wanted to put a space in between pet and sounds, we could do that there. We can change the, uh, the apps icon and different styles of tiles and things of that nature. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, what we want to do is change from the default icon, this little sunburst, to one that's more suited for our app. And I've created such an icon and it's available in uh, that downloadable uh, file that has all the assets for this entire series of videos. I unzipped that and put it into my documents directory. So uh, inside of the c9phone8.zip file, there are three folders. Remember, we were working with the pet sounds underscore assets folder in a previous video. And what I want to do is go to and find this application icon.png. And so you'll see if we were to open up over here in our uh, solution explorer, in our assets directory, we also have an application icon.png. So what I want to do is simply drag and drop it from my documents directory into my assets directory. And it asks, do we want to replace that application icon.png? Yes to that. And the next thing that I want to do is replace two of the tiles. Uh, there's these two iconic tile medium large.png and iconic tile small.png. And I want to replace them with the two that are in this tile subdirectory here in Windows Explorer. So I'm going to select these two files by holding down the shift key while I click on each of them. And I'm going to drag and drop them into the tile subfolder here in the Solution Explorer. And here again, it asks, do you want to replace them? Uh, and I'll select apply to all items because I don't want to just keep clicking yes. And that will copy the new versions. And as I hover over, you can see that we have a little duck logo suitable for use within our app. Awesome. Now back in the WM app manifest.xml file, since I replaced the old image file with a new one, I'll, I'll merely need to do this. I'm just going to close, go ahead and select yes to that, and then I'm going to reopen it and now it should have my duck app icon. Next I want to change from the tile template set to template flip to template iconic. And I want to choose support for large tiles. And for the tile title, I want to type in pet sounds. And then I want to change uh, the tile images. So I'm going to select a little ellipse button underneath small. And then I will uh, uh, navigate to uh, my project directory here. Let's get to pet sounds, pet sounds, assets and tiles and I'm going to select iconic small iconic tile small.png and click open and then I'll do the same for the medium iconic tile medium large.png great all right I'm going to save all of that 
And what I want to do next is I'm actually going to run the app. And once it's running on the phone emulator, I'm going to try to see uh, how my new tiles appear in the phone operating system. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just hit the start button on the face of the emulator. In order to get to the start page, I'm going to swipe over to the list of apps and scroll down. And you can see here's my Pet Sounds app, and it does have our new app icon. Very cool. So now what I want to do here, I'm going to move this up a little bit, and I'm just going to simulate holding down until the context menu pops up by just using my mouse, uh, my mouse button. Uh, and then holding down on the pet sounds icon and then selecting pin to start. And when I do that, you can see uh, the large tile is, uh, is displayed now. Awesome. Okay, so it's a really small detail, but it already feels more like a legitimate app to me with just that small change. Very cool. Okay, so next what we want to do is change, let's go ahead and click on this. We want to change the title and the page name. And so we know how to do this already. Now we haven't talked about text blocks just yet, but it's simply a way to put text onto your uh, onto your user interface. And if we take a look at the stack panel that was added by default by the page template, uh, we see our, our title panel with two text blocks, one that has the text my application and one that has simply the page name. And so what we want to do here is just make a couple of small changes. We're going to change my application and give it the name pet sounds in all caps because that seems to be the convention. And then on the page name, I'm going to change this to animals there. All right, you can see the changes reflected in the visual designer. All right, another small styling step, but again, it makes it feel more like a, a legitimate app. Take a look at this syntax. In fact, let me move some of these down so you can see it a little bit better here on screen. If you take a look at the second text box, notice that the style is set to this open and closing curly brace syntax with the word static resource inside and then this phone text title one style. Okay, uh, And this is going to require a bit of explanation. First, whenever you see open and close curly braces in XAML, it's referred to as a binding syntax. And there are two types of binding syntaxes. There's the static resource, uh, and there's also um, uh, another type that we'll talk about in just a moment. But the static resource is the one that we're going to primarily focus on in this lesson. Uh, let me focus on the term resource. A resource is an object that can be reused in different places in your application. So examples of resources include brushes and styles. And for more information, I just point you to the article on MSDN about XAML resources. You might want to spend some time looking at a more formal uh, definition of, of resources. It talks about static and dynamic resources and uh, the difference between the two. But we're only going to use static resources in our app. So I created a simple phone project called XAML resources. Let's check this out. And this will help illustrate the most simple static resource example that I can possibly think of. If you take a look at the very top of this page, you'll see that there's this section called the phone application page dot resources. So this page has a special resources collection. Uh, and we can put a number of resources and add them as instances of resources to this resource collection that's defined here. And uh, you can see that I've created two uh, resources. One is a solid color brush that I give the name My Brush. And now what I can do is set any properties of the solid color brush I want and then reference that brush by its name or its key, My Brush. Then later on, if I want to change uh, My Brush to a different color, I can change it one place and any anything that re referenced My Brush, it'll change all the colors. Uh, at the same time. So that's one benefit of using a static resource is that you can propagate changes to your entire app or to an entire page by making a change in one place since everything will reference these styles that you create. The second is a formal style and you see that it targets the type button and I've given it a name, my button background. And inside of here, I'm able to set 
properties to values. So in this case, I want to set the attribute or the property of background to the value of blue. And we could have multiple setters uh, inside of a style to set many different things. And we'll see examples of that as we go through the remainder of the series of lessons. Okay, so let's scroll down to where these are actually used. You can see that I've added two buttons to my uh, content panel, which I made a stack panel. I changed it from a grid to a stack panel. And here you can see where I have set a static resource set to my brush. So what happens? It looks up the key my brush and it uses the solid color brush with its color attribute set to brown and that's what we see here in this topmost button and the second button we see the style set to static resource my button background and we can see it's just referencing this style with the key my button background and we apply the setter uh, of the property called background to the value blue and that's what gives this button, its background color of blue. Now we could also add additional setters here for things like width and any other property of a button, but that's not something I wanted to illustrate in this, in this simple example. Okay, so I created these local resources on the page, meaning that any of these styles are available to anything on just this main page.xaml. But what if I wanted to share these resources across all of the pages that I add to my project. Now we haven't added any pro uh, pages to a project yet. We'll do that a little bit later. But what if we wanted to create styles that could be used globally across the entire project? What options do we have? Well, in that case, what we need to do is go to our app.saml file. We'll talk about its purpose a little bit later. But notice that it, the application object, has an application.resources, a resources collection. And so what we can do is actually cut and paste our styles that we defined here into this area here, and then those styles will be available across our entire project, and we'll do that in just a moment. Okay, so let's close this one down. Yes, that's fine, okay. And in our Pet Sounds project, you might be wondering where this phone text title one style is actually defined. Well, this is a little bit more tricky. It's actually a built-in style as part of the window phone op Windows Phone Operating System's theme resources. And a great place to learn more about this is on MSDN. You can see here, theme resources for Windows Phone. If you scroll down, uh, there are a number of different built-in themes by category. So for example, uh, brush resources. There's a phone accent brush, phone foreground brush, fo phone background brush, phone contrasting background brush, and so on. Uh, now the one that we're looking for is a text style. So let's scroll all the way down to text styles. And as we scroll through, what was the name of it again? I've already forgotten. Phone text title one style. Phone text title one style. It's this one right here. And you can see that the style is based on the phone text block base. So we could search this web page to find out more information about that style. We can look at which font family and which font style size it, it borrows from and so on. And you can see that it inherits most of its values from other styles. So I would simply say this you should resist the urge to use custom colors, fonts, and the like unless you have a good reason to, such as to match your company's established branding elements and so on. You should use these pre-built styles that will go along with the user's phone settings. When he goes into settings and chooses colors and fonts and sizes and things of that nature, we want to borrow whatever their choices are and use them in our app so that our app looks like it's part of the Windows Phone 8 ecosystem. Now it's also worth noting that many of the styles are based on styles which are yet based on other styles. So you have this visual inheritance and it allows developers to avoid repeating the attribute settings that'll be common across variations of the styles, like how cascading style sheets works in web development, for example. I said earlier that there were two binding expressions uh, on the Windows Phone. The second is just simply a binding, and this is used for binding to data, usually generic lists of custom types uh, with their properties set to the data that we want to work on in our app. Uh, and we bind that data to elements on our pages. 
And we'll see that at work much later in the series, but that will be important whenever we start to work with real live data, okay? But let's just hold on to that thought and just say that there are two different types of binding syntaxes. One's for the visual appearance, styling, things of that nature, and the other is binding to data. And we're talking purely about static resources binding to things that are visual in nature, I guess you could say. Okay, so let's have a little bit of fun. Like I said earlier, you typically want to stick with the phone's themed resources and use that web page that we referenced just a moment ago to find the right resource for whatever you're trying to work with whether it be text or backgrounds or whatever the case might be. However, we can edit a style if we would like to. I think that this might provide an additional insight or two on how all this works, so let's do this. Make sure that your cursor is somewhere here on the text block that we set to animals. So I'm just gonna put it right there. And I wanna to go to the properties window and I'm gonna make it a little bit larger here so we can see it. And I wanna go down to the miscellaneous section here at the bottom and you can see that the style property has a green box surrounding it and then a little green icon off to the right hand side. Uh, and if you click that little square or the text box, you'll see a context menu that pops up. And what we wanna do is select this convert to local value option. And when I do that, notice that uh, the style property is gone. In its place is a complex property uh, setting the text block dot style and a style inside defined inside of that. So as you can see, when we convert it from a theme style to a local style, we see part of the definition of that theme style. It's based on this phone text block base style, okay? and it overrides that style with two additional properties, font family and font size. And you can see that those are defined as theme styles as well. Here, the font family is selecting from phone font family semi-light and the font size is selecting from or inheriting from phone font size extra, extra large, okay? So let's override those settings with our own. So for example, instead of setting the value to another resource, let's just take control of this and set it to uh, Verdana, which should be a font on the phone. And furthermore, let's change the font size from this static resource and change it to a font size of 64 point, okay? All right, so that produces a slightly different appearance inside of our, of our app. And now what I want to do is make this style available to our entire app by making it a system resource. So what I want to do is highlight everything between the text block style, open and closing tags, and I'm going to cut those by right clicking and selecting cut. And then I want to open up the app.xaml file from before that we looked at a moment ago. And here in the application resources section, I want to add an attribute. So let's do this. Here, I'm just going to paste in what we have on the clipboard. And I'm going to add an attribute to this style called x colon name equals, and let's give it a name. My title text based on static resource, phone text block base, target type text block, that's all good. Everything else looks good. Let me just go ahead and move things onto different lines. Great. All right. So now if I return to the main page.xaml, what I want to do is I'm going to remove these two open and closing tags for the text block.style. Instead, I'm going to go back here to style equals, and then uh, I'm going to use the open and closing curly brace, and then in between them I'm going to type static resource, and I'm going to set it equal to my title text. All right, and the result now should be that that animals returns back. We may have lost it for a moment there when we were deleting things, but now it's back and it looks like uh, the changes that we made, which are now encoded as a style that the rest of our application can borrow from. So 
success. All right. So just to recap, the big takeaway from this lesson was the ways in which we can style our app to make it look like it belongs on the Windows phone while also expressing our own individuality. We learned how to modify the wmappmanifest.xml file to change the icons, the title of our app. We changed the app's title and page title uh, here in our XAML code inside of the stack panel. Uh, we learned how to bind to static resources like themed resources for the Windows Phone and how to create both local and system resources based on theme resources and much more. Okay, awesome. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, I'll explain how to localize our Pet Sounds app. And that simply means that we can present the various bits of text in our app in different languages. For example, I might want to support both English speakers and Spanish speakers, opening up the number of markets I could potentially sell my app in. Now, there's a bit more to selling in different markets than simply localizing my app. However, that would be a big step in the right direction. So our game plan in this lesson is first of all to talk about this special file called the appresources.res RESX file and how it allows us to store name value pairs that we can access in our declarative XAML code. You can also do it in C sharp code. We won't demo that in this lesson. But then we'll see how to create language and region specific variations of that file using Visual Studio's tools. And then finally we'll learn how the Windows Phone 8 operating system will choose the correct version of the appresources.resx file based on the current user's language and region selections. Okay, so if you expand the resources folder, you'll see that there's this file appresources.resx file. And if you double click it to open it up, in the main area, you see a special designer that has a series of name, and value pairs. So on the left hand side are the names of the settings that we're going to bind to and on the right hand side are the settings for a given language. Which, ang uh, which language? We can see the very last attribute here, the resource language is set to en-us. En means English and US is the region. In this case it means USA. Therefore these settings should be used in the USA for English speakers. It's also the default app resources file and you'll see the difference between the default and the other languages and regions that we'll support in just a moment. The name value pairs are mostly snippets of text that we'll use throughout the app. However, the resource flow direction right here is a setting for which direction the character should be represented for this particular language. So as you know, some languages are read from right to left and this setting would be used throughout the app for this purpose. So as you can see, there's an application title set to my application. What if I wanted to convert the text block on our main page.xaml to utilize this app resources setting? Well, I would use a binding expression like so. Let's get over there and then here, let's go ahead and change this, set this there. Okay, so instead of hard coding the, the name pet sounds, what we'll do is set binding path equals localized resources dot application title source equals and then here we'll go static resource localized strings. Okay, so let's go ahead and push that down like so. Great. Okay, so as you can see, I replaced the hard-coded text to this binding expression right here. Uh, this whole thing actually. Okay, uh, and there's several things at work here that would require a lot of background explanation. For now, just know that we're using a binding expression to bind data to an attribute, the text attribute. The path attribute here 
uh, of the binding expression refers to the localized strings.cs file here in our project. It and you can see that it simply just creates an instance of app resources, uh, which provides us access to the appropriate app resources file based on the region and preferred language of the phone's user. And we'll see it all come together in just a bit. Uh, the uh, where were we here? Yes. Okay. So the localized resources dot application title, and so this part names uh, or references the specific name entry in the app resources.resx file. The source attribute is bound to localized strings. Again, that's where the compiler can find the source of the localized resources property. It's part of the localized strings.cs file. Specifically, it's this class localized strings. Okay, so for a more in-depth discussion of how all these ideas interrelate, I would strongly encourage you, if you have any interest in this, to check out this great article on MSDN entitled, How to Build a Localized App for Windows Phone. In many ways, this is the article that kind of drove the whole process of, of this video. So for more information, go ahead and look at this article. Um, but at this point, we're only supporting English in the USA. I'd like to support the Spanish language, no matter which region of the world that the user resides. So to do that, what I want to do is right click the project name, Pet Sounds, not the solution, but the project name. I'm going to right click it and select Properties. And then uh, in the Properties window, I want to, under Supported Cultures, I want to select Spanish. Select Spanish. Next, I want to save. Uh, this file and close the property uh, the properties tab and you see this message uh, depending on what you currently have loaded in the main area of Visual Studio it says this file has been changed outside of the environment do you want to reload uh, reload the new file and I'm going to go ahead and select yes and so now when I do that notice that there is a new app resources file added it's app resources .es dot resx. Uh, the es is for espanol. So let's double click it to open it up in the main area and you can see that by default it's in English. Now with my son's help, he's a third year high school Spanish student, I'm able to translate the values from English to Spanish. So whatever you do, do not translate the names into another language. Leave them in English uh, and then change the values to your the language that you want to support. The names are tokens that are used programmatically. The values are what will be displayed to the end user. All right. Okay. So everything seems in order now. Uh, after I've completed the translations, I want to go ahead and run the app and use the phone emulator start button in order to get to the alphabetical listing of apps. So we'll go to the start button and then I want to look at uh, the listing of apps and I'm going to go down to the settings app. And I want to, on the system page, and there's several pages here that we can go back and forth with, I want to go down to the language and region. There we go. Currently set to English and United States. And what I want to do is change that to Espanol. And then if you look at the very bottom, there is a button that appears that says restart phone. Restart is required. So we'll go ahead and click that. And just to let us know that we're on the right track here, we see hasta luego. Now at this point, Visual Studio might disconnect from the emulator. That's okay. You don't need to be in debug mode in Visual Studio. Just focus on the phone emulator for now. And there's the disconnection. That's fine. 
All right, so the phone, phone emulator will use the last deployed version of our app, so it's still on there. We don't have to worry about it as long as we don't completely shut down the emulator. Okay, so once the phone emulator reboots, you can swipe over to the list and see that all of the options are now in Espanol. Uh, and so if we scroll down to our Pet Sounds app, and if we click it, we can see that instead of Pet Sounds, the text says uh, Pet uh, Sonida. Okay, I don't know how to speak Spanish, so I'm sorry if I said it incorrectly. But uh, at any rate, you can see that the title has been replaced with the title that we entered in the app resources.es.resx file. All right, so very cool. Now I would simply need to repeat that process, these steps that we took, especially creating those name value pairs and then using the binding expressions throughout the remainder of the app in order to completely localize the app's user interface. Now, unless you're bilingual, you'll probably want to retrace your steps and reset the phone emulator to use English. So let me do that as I close out this lesson. Uh, let's see, we want to get to settings. So at this point, I'm just looking for the little icon with the gear, which is configuration. And then... Look for Region e Idioma, I guess, how you say that. And we want to change from Espanol back to English United States. And then I'm assuming that says reboot the phone. <laughs> and it looks like we got it right. Okay, very cool. So while this is restarting, now there's an easier option too than going through those steps. You can just shut down the phone emulator at this point by using the little X here uh, or right click it in uh, the windows bar and then select close window and that will completely reset the phone emulator and put it back to uh, its original state and Visual Studio will restart the phone emulator with the default settings the next time you run it okay so to recap the big takeaway in this lesson was how to localize your app using the app resources files uh, the project properties and some binding syntax we saw how you could set the language and the region of our phone to test our localization customizations as well. So there you go. You just doubled the potential market for your app. Very cool. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. If you recall from the C-Sharp Fundamental Series on Channel 9, the C-Sharp compiler will take your code in the project and will compile it into a .NET assembly. Now, the end result is usually an executable file with the file extension .exe, at least for those simple console applications that we were, we were building in that series. And while we worked exclusively with the debug version of the app in Visual Studio, Simply by changing the solution configuration to release, from debug to release, we could then create a version of our assembly suitable for deployment on another user's computer, as long as they had the same version of the .NET Framework runtime installed on that computer that we used to compile our code into the .NET assembly. All right. So in this lesson, I want to talk about deploying our Windows Phone apps that we build to a physical device running the Windows Phone 8 operating system. Up until now, we've merely been deploying to the phone emulator. The compilation and deployment step is completely automated for us, and we might not be aware of how the program is packaged and installed into the emulator. Furthermore, we're going to want to understand the way in which the app is packaged because we'll want to undoubtedly deploy the app to a physical phone device for testing and we'll want to package the app so that we can submit it to the Windows Phone Store to be approved and included there for download or for sale. So our game plan in this lesson is, first of all, we want to kind of peek underneath the hood a little bit and see what happens whenever we compile our app. What does Visual Studio create for us exactly? And maybe by doing that, we can learn a little bit about the deployment process as a result. And then secondly, I want to actually deploy our, our Pet Sounds app to my phone. I'm itching to get it on my phone so that I can, I can annoy my family and friends <laughs> by uh, clicking the duck sound all the time, or maybe my cats by uh, clicking the, the meow sound and they see what their reaction is. Anyway, all right, so 
you know, up to this point, every time we hit the little run button on the, the toolbar, we hit F5 on the keyboard, uh, Visual Studio is creating a debug version of our app. Now, if you recall from the C-Sharp Fundamental series, it creates a bin slash debug directory where it places the .NET assembly as well as any additional files that are required for the app to run. So let's take a look in our own uh, documents, Visual Studio 2012 projects folder, and we're going to look in the pet sounds folder and we'll drill down to the pet sounds subfolder and you can see there's a bin directory here and there's also a debug directory. And then there's some folders. You can see that they match the ones in our Visual Studio project, like the Assets folder, the ES folder for the Espanol version of our app dot, uh, app resources .res file, and a uh, Properties folder. And then there's this um, app manifest.xaml file and a pet sounds debug any CPU.zap file. Now that zap file if we were to take a look at it. Actually, it's here in the little descriptive area. It's six megs. Now, I happen to know that file extension is a deployment package. It's a file that contains all of the files and configuration that's required to deploy our app on the Windows Phone 8 OS. And since it's so large, I suspect that it not only has our pet sounds DLL, which is only 15K, but it also has probably the entire assets directory with all of our sounds and tiles and so forth, all right? So let's have a little bit of fun here. What I'm gonna do is actually go to my desktop and I'm gonna drag, or actually I'm just gonna right click and select copy that zap file onto the desktop. So I have a copy of it now. And I'm just gonna work with this copy. I'm going to um, right click and select rename this file. And I'm going to rename the .zap file to a .zip file, all right? And it make, says, are you sure you want to change the extension? It might become unstable. I'm pretty sure we want to change that extension just to take a look at it. So now it's no longer a .zap file, but it's a .zip file. And uh, let's do this. I'm going to double-click this file to view its contents. And as you can see in Windows Explorer, we see the content of it. And I guess the first takeaway here is that a zap file is actually just a fancy zip file containing essentially whatever we saw in the bin slash debug directory of our project. And so if we were to drill into the asset subdirectory, we can see that there is an audio subfolder and a tile subfolder. And if we drill into that, there's an animal subfolder and then there's all these wave files. Uh, and so, uh, you know, here's all the WAV files that we copied into our project a few lessons ago, right there. So now let's back out of the uh, out of that zip file, back to the root. There we go. And I want to see what's inside this app manifest.xaml file. So I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to select. Whoops, actually I want to see this one. Right click and I'm going to select open and it opens it up in Notepad. You may have to choose Notepad as an option. I've already done this once, so it knew that I'm, I wanted to you know, open it using Notepad. Um, but at any rate, this WM app manifest.xml file is simply XML. Just there's a lot of it. In Visual Studio, this complexity is hidden from us through a friendly designer, a page in Visual Studio that restricts the changes that we can make to the file. Uh, but the real question is, why does this thing exist in the first place? Well, the purpose of the WM app manifest.xml file is to introduce your app to the phone's operating system. It tells the phone which images to use as tiles on the start page. Uh, let's see, yeah, right here. It, um, it tells the phone uh, which capabilities to support. So, for example, these capabilities, and we'll talk more about those later in this series. Uh, it also tells the phone the name of our uh, the uh, the name of our of our app and the version number of the app and what screen resolutions we support and so on. Um, it, this is how we integrate our app into the Windows Phone 8 operating system and its ecosystem of apps. Uh, so. That's pretty interesting. This 
zap file gets deployed to the emulator or to a physical phone and during that deployment process it unpackages all of the files including this WM app manifest file uh, the phone's operating system analyzes it and it determines which uh, icons it should use for its tiles what the name of it is what its capabilities are and so on so that when it shows up on our phone uh, the user then is able to run it and you know to see the tiles the i uh, the the name of the app uh, it'll give any warnings about the capabilities that of the phone it's trying to use and so on very cool okay so the next thing that I want to try to do in this lesson is to deploy the app to my Windows Lumia 920 phone. Uh, and the rest of this lesson assumes that you already have a Windows Phone Dev Center membership. It costs $99 per year. Uh, and you can see I'm going to log into it here in just a moment. And you'll go to dev or developer.windowsphone.com. So if you go to the uh, publish option in the navigation for the Windows Phone Dev Center, there's this option to join the program and it will tell you uh, what the process of joining is. You'll have to um, click there to join. You know, you have to pay $99 and things of that nature and I'll let you just work through that process. But in my case, I've already uh, joined. So let's take a look at my account. sign in and let's go to the dashboard and you can see so as you can see I have no apps you know I've made no money <laughs> no downloads uh, and just here some basic account information um, as well and this will become important a little bit later on as we want to publish our first app um, but at any rate, uh, what I want to do is just go down to the phones section. You have to register a phone uh, in order to test your app. So in order to deploy our, um, our Pet Sounds app to our phone, we're going to need to plug our phone into our computer using a USB cord that comes with the phone. And so I've done this many times before to transfer music or to charge the phone, but I've, I've never uh, done it with the intent of actually deploying an app to it. So what I want to do is I'm going to go to Visual Studio and I'm going to change from deployment to uh, or debugging through the emulator to the device instead. And now I'm going to hit the run button next to the word device. And I'm going to hit an error pretty early on. And it says there were deployment errors. Do you want to continue? Yes. Uh, it failed to connect to the device as it is developer locked. For details on this, uh, go to that particular URL. So to remedy this, I'm going to need to search for the Windows Phone developer registration app that was installed when I installed the Windows Phone 8 API on my computer. So uh, what I'm going to do is go to the search charm on Windows 8 and I'm going to type in uh, register and it'll be one of the first uh, apps that will show up in search and I'm going to go ahead and click on this and it opens up the Windows Phone Developer Registration app. Now you can see first of all if your phone is, screen is locked in other words if you don't have uh, if you have the lock screen on your phone you're going to need to uh, unlock it and then click retry and uh, now it's identified the Windows Phone 8 device. Click register button to unlock the phone. It's going to ask me to sign in. And, and I've had this issue where I've had to do this twice in order to get it to work. So let's see if it happens again here. It'll give me an error message the first time. Error logging into the Windows Phone Dev Center. But if you try it a second time, it usually works. And it's so consistent that i got to think there's something to that, uh, why it's doing that. So when I log in a second time, it's trying to find it. Congratulations, you've successfully unlocked your Windows Phone. Now in the text of this lesson below where I've embedded this video, you're going to see some edge cases, some other situations that might happen, like it's uh, the phone has been, um, uh, been used too many times and too many apps deployed to it. There's just a number of different error messages that you might experience. Uh, so be sure to read the rest of that text uh, below this video to get a full understanding of the different things that you'll need to be aware of before attempting to do this. But I'm going to go ahead and hit close and then try to deploy once again. Another deployment error. Continue. Yes. Oh, it's pin locked. Again, I'm going to need to turn on the power, unlock the screen, and then click OK and try it one more time. 
And so here we go. It's installing the application. And now I'm seeing the loading screen. Oh, look at there. Here we go. Here, maybe I should turn up the volume of this a little bit. There we go. And so will it quack? Yeah. And will it meow? No, it'll quack again. I'm <laughs> using a previous version of the app. Okay, but at any rate, uh, to exit out of the debug session, I'm just going to do what I would normally do. I'm just going to hit the stop debugging button. And now it returns me back to the phone's um, start screen. And, uh, you know, I can continue to develop. And uh, and even though I stopped debugging on the, uh, the app on my device, the app is still present there. And I can still run it even after I... Uh, unplug my phone so I'm gonna unplug my phone from the computer and then I'm gonna go over and take a look can I find pet sounds here uh, yes it's still here and I can still run it all right so I have it now on my phone awesome so each time I debug it'll deploy the latest version of my app to the physical device just like it did in the emulator Suppose that you want to unregister your phone uh, for development for some reason, like you're going to give it to somebody else. You can rerun that Windows Phone developer registration tool and it will identify the phone as being unlocked for development and it will provide an option to unregister the phone. Uh, also, if we were to go now and look and refresh this page out on dev.windowsphone.com, uh, you'll see my phone show up there, okay? And I can remove it from here or I can remove it using that utility, all right? All right, so uh, to recap, the big takeaway in this lesson was the composition of the deployment package. We looked at it just a fancy zip file, okay? We looked at the purpose of the WM app manifest.xml file. Visual Studio showed us this nice little designer, but behind the scenes is all this XML that's used by the phone's operating system to introduce our app onto the phone, all right? Uh, we looked at how to deploy our app to a physical phone device for debugging. Uh, we're still we're able to set breakpoints and step through the code, and it's running instead of in the emulator on our phone. We talked about registering the phone device to unlock it for uh, for development purposes, and then we can deploy apps to it at that point. Uh, we talked about briefly how to obtain a uh, Windows Phone Dev Center account, which is necessary before you go through that whole process. All right, so we'll pick it up in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Windows Phone emulator. And we've seen it already at work in this series several times and how crucial it's become to developing apps for the Windows Phone platform. So what I wanted to do was spend a little more time, become familiar with it, and then point you to some additional resources and give you some direction for more information after this lesson. So our game plan in this lesson is, first of all, we're gonna talk about what exactly the Windows Phone emulator is, and we're gonna talk about how it supplies different versions of the emulator uh, for different deployment scenarios to kind of uh, give you some options for the different types of phones that you might see on the market. Some with a lot of memory, some with little memory, some with large screens, some with small screens, and so on. Uh, then we're going to learn about the function of the emulator, uh, including the keyboard shortcuts that emulate the actual buttons, uh, physical buttons, on the side of the device. And then third, we're going to learn about uh, the controls of the emulator that allow you to resize it on screen, to rotate it, to simulate the act of handling the virtual device as if it were a physical one, uh, to shake it and things of that nature, uh, how to get accelerometer and GPS support and so on. Okay, so let's start by talking about what exactly is the Windows Phone emulator. Well, in a nutshell, the Windows Phone emulator is a desktop application, like you see here, uh, and it actually provides similar performance to the physical Windows Phone device. It provides a virtualized environment in which you can debug and test Windows Phone apps without having to have a physical device or deploying to the physical device every single time that you want to just test some small feature uh, that you've added to your app. And like I said at the very outset of this series of lessons, uh, you get the Windows Phone emulator when you install the Windows Phone 8 API and we had to make some special uh, changes potentially to our BIOS settings in order that it could run 
Microsoft's Hyper-V. Uh, and we talked about what Hyper-V was and basically we're running a whole operating system as a small application inside of our larger operating system uh, running Windows 8. And so that's why we need Microsoft's Hyper-V installed on our computer that we're going to be doing development on. And so for a more friendly introduction to Hyper-V on Windows 8, you want to check out this blog post from the Windows 8 team. I found it to be pretty valuable, bringing Hyper-V to Windows 8. Just some good background information. So while the emulator is great for development and quick debugging sessions, before you publish your app to the Windows Phone Store, Microsoft recommends that you actually test your app on a real phone. So make sure you heed that and you'll want to have at least one phone, if not more, uh, available to you if you're serious about app development. Okay, so let's do this. Let's stop the emulator from running right now. And, you know, when we were working through uh, these examples, up to now we clicked the little run debug button on Visual Studio's toolbar and we just left this default emulator WVGA 512 megabyte right so what exactly does that WVGA 512 megabyte really mean well the 512 MB or megabyte part indicates that we're running in a memory constrained environment the default emulator image that we use by default in Visual Studio is uh, the emulator WVGA 512, which emulates a memory constrained Windows Phone 8 phone. So, for example, the Lumia 610 is an inexpensive entry level Windows Phone 8 device which sports only 256 megabytes of RAM. By contrast, the phone that I have, the Lumia 920, has 1 gig of RAM. So, on lower RAM devices, having multiple apps running at the same time or creating a memory intensive app could cause performance problems. So to be sure that your app will run well on lower RAM devices, you can test your app using a realistic emulator image. And there are a number of great, uh, number of great articles about RAM usage on the phone on MSDN. So let me point you out to just a couple that I found valuable as I was pr preparing for this series of lessons. The first one is app performance considerations for Windows Phone. And then the second one is optimizing apps for lower cost devices. You'll definitely want to pay attention to these as you're building your apps uh, to make sure that you're accounting for all the different potential consumers of your app. So we talked about the 512 and how that might be a memory constrained version of the emulator. What does this WVGA mean? What is that an acronym for? Well, the emulator allows you to test your app on a uh, on a unique emulator image for each of the screen resolution resolutions that are supported by Windows Phone. So this default selection, uh, WVGA, encourages you to target the largest possible market for your Windows Phone 8 app. And if we were to drop down this little arrow, we can see that there are a number of additional options here. Uh, there's the WVGA WXGA, which is 1280 by 768, which is the largest resolution. And then this emulator 720p, which is um, it's like a high def resolution. And it's close in size to the WXGA. The orientation is just a little bit different. Uh, if you run the default, then go to the settings app in the about button and you can see that confirmed. So let's go ahead and just run this here. And we'll go to here and we'll go to settings. Whoops. Settings. If you go to the about near the bottom, you can see that this particular one is running at a resolution of 480 by 800, which again is the WVGA. Uh, it tells you the operating system and all that kind of stuff as well. All right. Um, so how does this translate into the actual phones that are on the market right now? Well, I already told you about the Lumia 920. It has a display size of four and a half inches wide uh, at its, you know, diagonally. And then the display resolution is the WXGA, the 1280 by 768. The Lumia 820 is, has a slightly smaller uh, uh, display size at 4.3 inches and its uh, display resolution is WVGA, the 800 by 480. 
And then, like I mentioned at, uh, just a moment ago, the Lumia 610 has a display size of 3.7 inches, so considerably smaller. And there you find the WVGA, the 800 by 480. So I realize by the time that you watch this video, there might be newer phones on the, on the market. The point is that you should be aware of the fact that you're going to need to support different screen resolutions and memory constraints. Uh, like I talked about in the lesson on laying out XAML, you want to eliminate specific pixel sizes for layout, except for margins and things like that. Uh, so choosing from the different emulator sizes can make sure that you're on the right track and that your app's going to look good no matter which phone your consumer potentially has. All right. All right. So now let's talk about the special features of the Windows Phone emulator. Uh, let me move it over here a little bit. Uh, I'll not spend a lot of time on the phone's basic navigation. I mean, if you've already got a physical phone or if you play around with this one, you can see there's basically two screens. There's this uh, start page where you pin apps to, and then there's the app page where you can find all the apps that are installed on the phone. Um, and essentially, by using the emulator, you're going to have an identical experience, or well, at least almost identical experience, uh, complete with the start and the apps page. You have a uh, search and you can do uh, web browsing and things of that nature. There'll be um, the clock and the battery in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and so uh, when I actually got my first Windows Phone device, I already was pretty much familiar with the with the navigation of it because I'd worked so much with the emulator. Very, very similar. So you actually have uh, the same hardware buttons on the bottom of the emulator as you would have on a real Windows phone. However, you're going to be missing the buttons on, like I said, the side of the phone here. For example, my Lumia 920 has three buttons on the side. It has a volume up down button, it has a power button, and then also at the bottom it has a camera button. Uh, and these can be accessed in the emulator with keyboard function keys. And so there's a great list of keyboard mappings here, as you can see on this web page uh, from MSDN. But essentially, there are a number that you should be familiar with, uh, depending on the type of app that you're building. Like, for example, if you're building a, a photo or pictures app, you'd want to become familiar with the F6 and the F7 button for the camera halfway down, which will start the initialize the flash feature, or the F7 for to take a, a picture by pushing the button completely down. Uh, the F9 and F10 raise and lower the volumes, respectively, uh, of the, the sound on the phone. F11 plays or pauses the audio that's currently playing on the phone. It simulates an inline headphone button that pauses music and answers incoming phone calls. So if you double tap the button, it'll skip to the next uh, track on your playlist or your album. Okay, And then the F12 key is the power button or the lock screen so that you can you know, act like you're shutting the phone down or at least getting out of the uh, of, of given app. And then F1, F2, and F3 simulate the, the bottom buttons on the, the face of the phone. So the back button, the Windows key, and the search button, respectively. All right, so let's talk about working with the emulator keyboard. Let's do this. I'm going to hit the, uh, the search button. And then if you were to put your mouse cursor in uh, the area where you would search for something in Bing.com, uh, you'll see the keyboard pops up. And I can use my mouse to simulate typing the keys. For example, if I wanted to start typing, uh, it obviously takes a little bit of time to hunt and peck around. Um, and what I can do is, uh, is eliminate this keyboard by using the page down key on my keyboard. Uh, so, for example, here you can see I removed the keyboard and now I can just type on my actual physical keyboard hooked up to my computer. And um, there's also the page up button which will show the keyboard again and then there's a pause or break button that toggles the keyboard so you could just use that all the time. So as you can see I typed in the phrase Selfridge Chicago looking for articles or a Wikipedia article on one of Chicago's most famous sons, Harry Selfridge, who founded the retail store Selfridges of London and is uh, also the subject of a popular TV show on the BBC. So when I clicked uh, the, uh, the go button on the little keyboard Bing search works in the emulator just as it would on a physical device 
it will, if it's the first time that you run it, it'll ask for permission to use your location in case uh, that would influence the search results. For example, if I was in London while searching for this, Bing might show me a map of the Selfridges that are near me where I'm physically standing in London. However, since I'm in the USA, Bing will deliver different results. Uh, and I'm going to show you how the emulator determines this location in just a moment. Uh, but at any rate, you can see that we get, um, you know, a Wikipedia article and some additional, uh, additional content uh, from our search. Uh, in addition to the virtualized phone on screen, there's a floating menu off to the right-hand side that we kind of ignored up to now. But it, uh, with a little experimentation, it'll reveal that the first six buttons are in order. Uh, this X button will shut down the emulator. The minus button will, uh, will minimize it to the uh, Windows taskbar. You can rotate the emulator 90 degrees counterclockwise or rotate it clockwise. And you can see the animation as you do that. All right. There we go. And... Uh, this button will expand the emulator to fit the largest size that it can fit comfortably on your computer screen. And then this button here will actually bring up the little zoom dialog, which will allow you to choose some from some preset uh, sizes to zoom in for the size of the emulator on your computer screen. Uh, this little double chevron over here to the right hand side will open up this additional tools dialog. And this is where we're gonna spend uh, the majority of the rest of this lesson. Uh, there are a number of tabs across the top of the screen. There's accelerometer, accelerometer location, screenshot, and network. Uh, the first is the accelerometer, which can be used to test apps that utilize the accelerometer sensor within uh, the phone. So what you can do is just like pull this little button down and it simulates uh, the changing of the X, Y, and Z position of the phone in 3D space, all right? So that's essentially what we're doing when we're pulling it like this or pushing it forward. We're moving it back and forth, right? Um, you can also change the, uh, the orientation, uh, like if whether it's up this way or flat down by changing these orientations. And then there's also recorded data. So for example, you can see what will happen if we try to shake the phone. And you can see those pre-recorded values were going wild because it's simulating the fact of somebody doing this with their phone. Very cool. All right, let's get this back oriented correctly. There we go. Uh, so the next, the next tab I found uh, the most interesting, it's the location tab, which allows you to set the current location of the phone. So even though I'm sitting in Dallas, Texas right now, I can act like my phone is, uh, that I'm testing my phone in Chicago or any other place in the world. But notice by default that it's gonna go to Seattle, all right? So a little nod to the gentleman in, uh, in Redmond that actually built the phone. So if I wanted to change this location, I can type in Chicago, Illinois, and then hit the search or the enter key on my keyboard. You can see that it brings up a map of Chicago. Uh, I can use my mouse button to set a specific location. I can also zoom in and zoom out. Uh, but now when I click somewhere in Chicago to, to add a, a, a marker, you can see that it will give me the exact latitude and longitude coordinates for that marker. The neat thing is once I make that change, I can go back over here to my apps and if I find the map app on the phone and it says, "Can will you allow maps to access and use your location? Okay, the, the phone now thinks it's moved across the country from Seattle to Chicago and you can see we're here in Cicero neighborhood near where I grew up. Okay, very cool. Uh, and then let's move on now. The third tab is for creating screenshots. So it, this can be helpful whenever you're creating documentation or whenever you're trying to document bugs in your app and you wanna upload them uh, somehow. They're also useful when you're submitting your app to the store because you're gonna need so many screenshots at different resolutions. And then the final tab is the network tab. And there's not a lot you can do here other than to see the IP address of the phone on your network. 
Okay, so in addition to the emulator itself, let's go ahead and shut this down. Uh, Visual Studio has some tooling that can affect how the XAML designer displays the phone, how it displays the orientation, the theme color, uh, and uh, the chrome around it here in the XAML editor. And so the first thing that you can do is go to this device window off to the left hand side and you can see that you can change for example the orientation, uh, the display size, the theme, the accent color, whether or not to show the chrome around the device and now we see we've gotten rid of all of that just by unchecking that check check mark and so on and we can also make it large enough so that it fits whatever window resolution we've we've assigned to it so let's go ahead and undo that there's also a simulation dashboard uh, so if you take a look at this little button that's next to uh, the supported platforms drop down uh, the simulation dashboard pops open here kind of on top of your solution explorer and I'm gonna have to make some room here so you can see it nicely the simulation dashboard gives you the ability to simulate different network uh, conditions, like if you wanted to throttle the speed of the network and then test how your app will perform when it has almost no network or just Wi-Fi speeds, uh, or you want to change the signal strength and see how that impacts your app, you can do that here. You can also lock or unlock the, uh, the lock screen and trigger reminders uh, for um, the purpose of um, as you will see a little bit later uh, on the lock screen itself. Okay, So basically you have many ways to test and monitor your app during development time so you can gain some confidence in how it will perform once you distribute it to the store. Alright, so let's recap. Uh, well, One last thing. Uh, it's, it's okay to leave the emulator up and running uh, even when you're actually developing here and you're writing code, uh, you don't have to shut it down every single time. Uh, when you relaunch your app in debug mode from Visual Studio, part of the process is deploying the latest version of the app to the phone. It's time consuming to relaunch the emulator every single time you want to do that. And Visual Studio will connect to an existing emulator instance whenever it needs to. So to recap, the emulator is a great tool that allows you to quickly deploy your app during development to a virtualized Windows phone. We looked at how to test different device sizes and memory constraints, how to manipulate the emulator to test for rotation and motion, uh, how to make it the phone think that it's located geographically in a specific place, and a and a, a bunch of uh, other cool little options and things that you can use as well. We're going to use these skills extensively throughout the rest of this series, so hopefully you're paying attention. All right, that wraps it up. We'll keep going in the next lesson. See you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. We spent the first nine lessons learning the absolute basics and we were able to build a simple app. I mean, the PetSounds app is, it's a nice start, uh, but it's a little bit limiting at the moment. I mean, we only have one category of sounds, animal sounds, and we only got two sounds, the quack and the meow, and I've got larger aspirations for, for the app that we're going to build here than just two sounds. Uh, what I'd like to do is to turn this into a more full-fledged soundboard app with multiple categories of sounds. Uh, not just animals, but taunts and warnings and all kinds of different types of sounds. And maybe even a, a custom category where we can record our own sounds into the phone and then have them available for playback whenever we wanted to annoy our friends or, or, our, or our cube mates. Okay? So we need a good way to represent multiple categories of sounds. Not just one category, but multiple categories inside of our app. And I'm willing to bet that there's at least one template that's available in Visual Studio that will help give us a good starting point to get us pretty close to what I have in my mind. So in this lesson, what I want to do is create a couple of different projects. And we'll throw these projects away, but I want to review two project templates available in Visual Studio to learn a little bit more about what they can do and in so doing determine if there's a good fit between the built-in capabilities of that template and what I have envisioned in my mind for our new version of our soundboard app. So the game plan for this lesson is first of all we're going to create a sample Windows Phone data bound app project using the templates in Visual Studio. 
to discover the built-in functionality of that template. We're going to look at the code and discover how it accomplishes those features. And then we're going to repeat this process for a second project template called the Windows Phone Pivot App Project Template. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and get started in Visual Studio. I'm going to go File, New, Project. And we'll want to make sure we're working with the C-sharp Windows Phone templates. And we want to select the Windows Phone Data Bound App Project Template in the center area. Now, yes, we get a little description here off the right-hand side, but it's just a little reminder. We want to really dig in and understand how this thing works, see what it does and so on, see it live in action. So I'm not going to give it a, a, a name because we're going to throw this away. We'll just leave the default Data Bound App 1 name and then click OK. And we're going to target the 8.0 version of the Windows Phone operating system. And after Visual Studio sets up our new project, what we'll want to do is immediately run the app just to see what functionality we get out of the box. And when we run the app, you can see that the main feature of this app is a list of items. We can scroll through the items and even tap on one of the items. Let's take a look at let's whoa. Let's take a look at one of the items. For example, this runtime one. There's there's a large header for runtime one, runtime two, runtime three, and then below each of them there's some smaller text, what I would call lorem ipsum text, some fake Latin, just for filler text that means nothing. When I click on one of them, you can see that we see that particular item full screen on a second page of our app and you can see that there is this uh, the title and then the second line of text which has the complete lorem ipsum okay and it works for each of the items and we can use the back button to go back and so on okay great so the real question is what is what's making this work I mean what is this is this a control or how are we seeing all of these items and where does this data come from so let's keep that in mind as we investigate uh, the anatomy of this app. And I'm going to start here on the main page.xaml and I'm going to scroll down to the content panel and I see immediately that the content panel is filled with this control called a long list selector. And if we were to take a look at the attributes of the long list selector, you can see that it has an item source attribute that's set to a binding syntax and we're binding to something called items. All right, and then we can see that there is an item template that's set to an instance of data template. And inside of this data template, there is a stack panel and two text blocks. Now, as I'm making selections here in the XAML, do you notice what's going on in the, uh, in the viewer off to the left-hand side? When I put my text uh, my cursor inside of the text block here, you can see it it puts a blue selection box around this design one. And when I put my mouse cursor inside of text block, the second one here, it it highlights the little text underneath of it. So what we have here is a template. Each item in a collection of items will be represented with this block of XAML. So we have, you know, on screen here, what, a bunch of like six of these items, just fake data, dummy data, but it gives us an idea that each instance of an object inside of a collection called items will get its own stack panel with two text blocks. So that's the notion of an item template represented by this data template we've created here or that's been created for us in the XAML. Okay. So the real question is, where is all this data coming from? Well, what we can do is, the simple way to go about this is just to take a look at this sample data folder. This would probably give us a nice clue since its name is sample data. And if we were to open this up into our main area here, you can see that we have an object called main view model, and it has an items property. And this items property seems to hold a collection of objects each of those objects are of type item view model. And notice the attributes 
of each instance of item view model. There's an ID attribute, a line one attribute, and a line two attribute. And notice that the names of line one, line two, line three, line four, they happen to match up with what we see here in our, in our designer. Furthermore, line two for each of these objects uh, match up with what we see in the second, the smaller subtitle for each of these items. So that provides us a clue. We would expect to see somewhere defined a class named main view model, and that main view model class would have a bunch of attributes. One of the attributes would be an items attribute, a collection, maybe like a list of T, and those and the T would be item view model. So there must be another class defined in our project called item view model somewhere. So as I take a look through the folders of this app that were cre uh, this template, there is a view models folder, and if I open that up, whoa! Notice that I get a main view model class. Whoa, that matches this, and an item view model class. And you think that it has something to do with this item view model here? Well, let's take a look at that real quick. Item view model .cs. It's just a simple class and it has a number of properties defined. Let's roll some things up here just to make it all nice and clean and obvious. All right. So this class has an ID property, a line one property, a line two property, and then a line three property. I don't think we're using that. And also has some other stuff, and we'll talk about this other stuff in a little bit. But that is the item view model class and we're creating instances of that item view model here in XAML and adding them to a collection called items. Now let's just go for broke here and take a look at this main view model class that should match this data that we have generated here, instances of those items in, uh, in this XAML file. And notice that it has a property call. Where are you, property? There you are. Um, an items property of type observable collection of type item view model. All right, well, I've never seen, or you may have never seen this observable collection uh, class, but think of it for now like a list. Like we talked about generics and generic collections in the uh, C Sharp Fundamentals course on Channel 9. So, just borrow that knowledge that you gained in that series. And if you don't remember it, then go back and watch those videos. But we have a collection of objects of a certain type. And that's what we have here, a collection of objects of a certain type. Every object in that collection has to be of type item view model. Okay? So that's our first clue. The second part is this I notify ch property changed interface. And if we look at our other class, it also has this I notify property changed interface. Well, what's that all about? Well, it has something to do with what we see below that here, with this event called property change event handler. And event, we're basically publishing an event that says that will raise and will say, hey, I raised myself. Hey, I'm an event. If you're listening to me, I just fired off. Okay, so it's just a way of notifying other classes that might be looking at that class or might hold a reference to that class to say something about me changed. So what this I notify property changed interface does is it enables this feature in .NET called observability. And it says if you're looking at me, I can tell you when something about me changed. For example, if during the course of the execution of this application, some code changes the value of the line two property, changes it from its default that was set up during construction. This, in the setter of this property, it will say, hey, whatever your value is, notify that I changed. And so it will call this helper method called notify property change. Notice we have that defined here. And it will in turn kick off this property changed event handler. So in other words, it works like this. If there's code that changes, for example, the line two property, the line two property will say in its setter, hey, let somebody know that I changed. 
And so it calls this method, which says, you changed? Okay, well then I better notify anybody who's looking at me. And so it raises it in a very public way and says, I changed. Hey, hey, if you're listening to me, I changed, okay? And so anything that's listening to that object will then say, oh, you changed? Then I need to do something. Well, what's listening to this object? Well, that's where this main view model class comes in. It too has it implements this, this uh, I notify property changed uh, uh, interface. And it too has, you know, all that plumbing that we would see here at the very bottom with, it has a, a public event and then it has this private notify property changed uh, helper method. But notice that it has this, again, observable collection. So uh, this is observability. It says, if something about my little, my collection of objects changed, if it says, hey, I changed, then I need to say, hey, I changed. As one of my, one of my little, uh, one of my uh, objects that I'm holding a reference to, they changed. So if you're looking at me, you need to update yourself. So in the long list selector, I'm binding to main view model dot items so that if any of the instances of item view model change I can say my collection changed you need to update yourself long list selector okay so that in a nutshell is the notion of observability and it's the foundation for this um, for this pattern called model view view model or MVVM. Okay, so the important question is, why would any other code want to be notified about the changes going on inside of this collection? Well, as this example stands right now, there's absolutely no reason in the world why any other code would want to be notified because all of this sample data here, it's all static. And from the way that the template is created, again, as it stands, nothing is changing the values inside of these instances of these properties, okay? Um, and so what if, however, we wanted to support a new feature inside of this app where these individual list items were being updated constantly from some outside source, say for example, a web service. So the web service delivers new lorem ipsum every 30 seconds, why? I don't know, okay, and this doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this case, but it might be sports scores or it might be news stories or something else that needs to be updated every so often. Uh, but if that's the case then, as silly as it might sound, if we added the code to dynamically change the data in each instance of these item view models, then that's the only thing that would need to change in our app. Every property would automatically be updated and say, hey, my value changed whenever we updated an instance of these objects and the observable collection would report this to the long list selector and then it would be automatically updated uh, in our app on screen, okay? So all of this extra code here that's used uh, implementing the I property change, I notify property changed interface and implementing this event and this private method, uh, in, in all of the the set code here that's that's generated again it enables that feature called observability so our soundboard app probably is not going to require observability so I'm not going to implement all this extra code in our version of our app however if I had a good candidate for this style of application where my data could change often then I would definitely take this approach that's been templated in this project and the good news is that here's a nice template for you to use. You can just kind of fill in the blanks and add your own properties and make sure you follow this basic style of the sets and the gets uh, and, and everything should, should work just fine. Okay, so this long list selector is obviously using some sample data at design time, but what's going on at runtime? Is it using this data at runtime? Well, as we'll see in a moment, we're not. Take a look at what happens whenever we run the app. Uh, in the app.xaml.cs file, you can see that we create uh, 
a property called view model. And so this view model property will be global to the entire app. All we need to do from anywhere in our C sharp code is just called app because it's a global object in our Windows Phone apps. So app.viewmodel. And when we do that, uh, we will return an instance of view model. If, if a view model instance is not already created, then we'll set it to a new instance of our main view model. In other words, this topmost object in our object hierarchy that holds through its items collection uh, a number of item view model instances, right? And then whenever in here in the application activated uh, event handler, so when the app first loads and when it's first activated, it'll say, hey, app view model, are you loaded? Do you have your data loaded? So let's take a look at the main view model.cs and you'll see there is this is data loaded. It's basically just a Boolean flag, true or false. Yes, I have data loaded. No, I don't have data loaded. If you don't have data loaded, then go ahead and load your data. All right, so let's take a look at the main view model. Is there a public method called load data? Oh, there is a public method called load data. And look at what it does. It uses its own, it's adding items to its items collection that it defined here, this observable collection of item view model. So it's creating new instances of item view model, setting its ID, its line one and its line two at runtime uh, to these instances. So that's where the data is coming from at runtime. This is where the data is coming from at design time. And that's why it's defined in this XAML file, because as we'll see a little bit later, if you look at the very top, you'll see that at design data, it's binding to sample data slash main view model sample data dot XAML. That's what gives us this design time experience in Blend or in Visual Studio. But at runtime, we're actually generating the uh, the data here and then we say yep that is loaded now we're ready to go so if you wanted to uh, replace where you're loading your data from you would do it here in this load data uh, method okay uh, you could modify this to retrieve data from a web service or from a local database or from a different XML file one more thing this takes care of the case where we're activating the app for the first time what about the case where we're navigating away from the app and then coming back to it at some point in time in that case uh, you'll take a look at the main page .cs. it has almost the identical code in it so in the on navigated to event so we've navigated to our main page .xaml. is your data loaded yes or no oh no I don't have data loaded okay well then go ahead and load your data Oh no, I have data loaded. Okay, well then ignore that. All right, that's what this is doing right here. And it's just using, again, mainviewmodel.cs, uh, its load data method and its is data loaded method to determine whether it should load data or not. Okay, there we go. All right, so hopefully at a high level, you can see how the Windows Phone data bound app template is wired up to enable data access through a pattern called MVVM utilizing features in C-sharp and the Windows Phone runtime called observability. You'll want to keep that in mind because that's a popular pattern whenever you're working with XAML code in Windows Presentation Foundation apps, in Windows 8 App Store apps, oh, and then obviously here on the phone, okay? So while the data binding project, here let's run it real quick, it does accommodate several features that we want implemented in our soundboard app. I mean, we want to be able to have individual items and we want to be able to click on one and play a sound uh, we still need a way to navigate between different categories of sounds right now we would only have like one category I, it, imagine we'll replace page name with animals how do we get to warnings and taunts and, and other sound effects well there's no easy way to navigate between them so tell you what we're gonna do with that in mind let's stop this and we're gonna go file new project and this time we're going to select the Windows Phone Pivot App template and we're going to leave the name alone and we're going to click OK. Okay and we'll go ahead and make sure that we're targeting version 8 of the operating system.
And so immediately what we want to do is run the app and see it, see what it'll do without any modifications. This looks a little bit more like what we're interested in, right? Uh, here are all the individual items. Now, if you click on them, they don't do anything. That's just because it's been disabled, but we can get that, that functionality back. But more importantly now, in addition to having each of the individual items that we can click on, we have these uh, categories of items. So we're able to now go between a first listing and a second listing, and this is exactly what I'm looking for, okay? Admittedly, it looks like we're working with this with sample data and the long list selector is data bound to the same list, no matter whether I choose first or second. But uh, the idea here is that we can create a pivot that has multiple pivot item elements. So here's the first pivot item element and the second pivot item element, uh, what I may have referred to as a view or a page or something like that a moment ago. And each of those will contain a long list selector that's bound to, ideally, different data. So let's take a look at how this is implemented in our XAML code. Here again, we're going to take a look at our content panel. Oh, there is no content panel. Instead, what we have is a pivot control. And the pivot control has a title called My Application. So this is going to take up the entire space of our uh, of our layout route. All right, and notice that there are a number of pivot items. The first pivot item has the header of first, and the second pivot item has the header of second. Each pivot item has a long list selector. The long list selector has its item source set to bind to an items collection, uh, and the property element syntax for each item template is set to an instance of data template. The same stack panel and text blocks that we saw previously in the data bound app uh, template. If we were to look at the sample data, it also sports this main view model sample data dot XAML. Uh, we can see that it defines this object hierarchy of main view model, which has a collection of items, and each of the items are instances of item view model. And if we take a look at the view models folder, it too has a main view model class and an item view model class. And if you were to look at these, these are identical to what we saw before. Okay, so the good news here is that um, this is we're familiar with almost everything. Uh, that's already here from this point on. The main difference here is the pivot control that has a number of pivot items and each of those have long list selectors that we bind to. All right, so we could use the, the, uh, the, the Windows Phone pivot app template to create categories of sounds and each sound would be rendered based on its data template. And we could create a data model that would have categories that contain collections of sounds, including information like the name of the sound, the path to the wave file that will be that will be played in the media player. And so the good news is that we have a clear direction now for what needs to happen next. What remains is just implementation details, and we'll do that in the next several videos. So to recap, in this lesson, we learned about the features of the Windows Phone project templates, the data bound template and the pivot template, and they share almost identical features. They both data bind a long list selector to a data model that's populated with data uh, at, at design time from an XML file and at runtime inside of our main view model.cs load data method, all right? And not only is the data data bound to controls inside of a data template like we see here, but um, the, the templates provide a pattern for monitoring changes to the underlying data and automatically updating the user interface, user interface as those changes are made. Now we're not going to need that feature in our projects, but it's nice to know that it's there and that is a simple pattern that we can use in these project templates should we ever need it. Uh, and then finally, we saw the use of the pivot control and how to create individual pivot items in order to allow us to move between categories of sounds. Awesome. All right, so let's pick up that thought in the next lesson, and then we'll begin building our soundboard app that we'll submit to the store. We'll see you there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.